Assalamu alaikum warahmatullah. How's everybody doing today? Good to see everybody. So I'm so excited. We're starting a new block today. Um, today we're starting the section of the second half of the uh, Makkan call. So right here on your circle where you have early Mecca, today we are going to be uh, doing that second half, okay? So um, you are welcome to, I, am, I encourage you, can you to- please, Can you please mute everyone? everyone? Can I mute everyone? Yes, okay. That is a really good yeah. suggestion. So welcome, Asfa. So <laughs> welcome everybody, mashallah, may Allah reward you for your sincerity and your dedication. So what we're doing today is we're gonna be doing that second half of early Mecca. So we're gonna be going over a pretty large section of this book those of you who have the book, um, we are on page 109, and we're actually going all the way to page 144. We're gonna be uh, following along in this book. So let's turn to page 109. This is the fourth year of the public invitation, the fourth year, okay? And so this is called uh, the first public encounter. So this is what happens. We know that up until now, the uh, Prophet Muhammad وسلم, was doing everything privately. And this is for many reasons. This is just, um, you know, so that he could create some strong bonds with people that he trusted. And now that he had a few of those people that we went over yesterday and we focused on learning some of those uh, people well, he is now going to go out to the next step, right? He's going to make a public um, and count, you know, he's going to make a public call to Islam. And so the very first thing we're going to learn about is the first public encounter. So when these Muslims started worshiping in public, there were people who didn't like that for many reasons. Um, number one, it was a different way from their forefathers. Uh, the Makkans and the Quraysh were people who are very loyal to their traditions. They're people who are, you can call that, um, you know, that can be translated in other societies as, you know, maybe some people are nationalistic, maybe some people are traditional, maybe, you know, whatever the reason is, they had a certain loyalty to their ways. They had a certain um, loyalty to the way that they did things. And so one thing that happened is when a group of, when a group of uh, worshipers were worshiping in congregation, uh, they got harassed by another group. They got harassed. And so a man named Saad ibn Abi Waqqas, which is a companion of the prophet that we learned about yesterday, he's a maternal cousin, he went and wounded one of those instigators. So there you go, there's like a first public encounter, the first conflict that people saw between the true Muslims and the others, and that's a Kahoot question, that name. And so Surah Muzammil and Surah Tariq, uh, you know, um, give condolences and, and uh, they urge the companions to patiently endure the Makkan assault. One thing about this section from the years four to six is there was a lot of surahs revealed during this time. So it's very heavily going to, we're going to have a lot of uh, content that's very heavy in uh, these different surahs that have come in. And so we see uh, Surah Muzammil coming in and Surah Athariq in which um, Allah SWT is encouraging patience. He's saying, for example, still on page 109, have patience with what the Makkans are saying and distance yourself from them in an amiable way. Let me deal with those deniers who have the finer things in life. Also in Surah Tariq, it says, um, Allah SWT says, through the faithless continue to plot their schemes. I make a plan as well, so give the faithless some time and leave them alone for a while. So these beginning revelations in year six, I mean, in year four, are going to um, advise the prophet and his believers to be patient through the trials, patient through the trials. So um, if you look down, there's a, there's a little uh, tan box and there's a keyword called hilm, hilm. And that is a Kahoot question. What does it mean to have hilm? To have hilm is to have forbearance. The answer to that question is to have forbearance, to have a beautiful patience, a beautiful patience. In fact, they actually named an entire um, short book series on this word hilm. If you've heard of that book series called Hilmi the Hippo, that word Hilmi the Hippo, um, that name came from the word hilm. So hilm is having a beautiful patience. And here, yes, Asma's asking, are you sure? Yes. If you look at some of the descriptions in that book, it is by a Muslim author. Yes. So if anybody ever read that book series, it's about, um, the, it comes from the root word helm, but if let's read a little bit about what it means to have helm, because that is something that we aspire to have, right? So it says, 
It says, men and women of Helm were forbearing, patient, and merciful. They could control their anger and remain calm in the most difficult circumstances. Instead of exploding with rage, they were slow to retaliate. They did not hit back when they suffered injury, but left revenge to Allah. Hilm also inspired positive action. If they practiced Hilm, Muslims would look after the weak and disadvantaged, liberate their slaves, counsel each other to patience and compassion, and feed the destitute even when they were hungry themselves. It must have been very difficult indeed for Muslims brought up in the Jahili spirit to practice Hilm and turn the other cheek. So if we look, there's also, we are currently, for those who just joined, we're at the bottom of page 109. Today, we are going from page 109, inshallah, to 144 as an overview of the years four through six. Um, and so Surah Al-Furqan, the criterion says, for true servants of the most gracious, they are those who walk gently on earth and who, when the jahilun address them, reply peace. Okay, and so this is a reminder to all of us, actually. And uh, this is a very strong attribute that, those first believers really had to have because they had to endure a lot during that um, initial period of the public call. And so uh, the Quraysh were feeling threatened by the Prophet's growing influence. And so whenever Abu Talib came to the Prophet and asked his nephew to step back a little bit and concede, this is what the Prophet said. This is a Kahoot question. It's a famous quote of the Prophet. Says, oh, my uncle, this is the Prophet speaking. O oh, my uncle, by Allah, if they put the sun in my right hand and the moon in my left hand, on condition that I abandon this course, I would not abandon it until Allah has made me victorious and I perish therein. So here, um, that is the answer of the prophet. That is how determined and faithful and loyal that he was. And um, you know, he, he was determined to stay on the path of Islam. And Abu Talib returns with his own. He says, go and preach whatever you please, for by Allah, I will never forsake you. So, you know, he accepted that, and he said, I'm going to respect you for what you do. Let's move to page 110. Here on page 110 and 111, we have a series of surahs that are revealed. So, uh, what we have here on page 110, for example, surah Mu'minun, okay, uh, we have surah Dukhan, surah An'am, we have a lot of verses that invite uh, to belief and reflection. That is a Kahoot question. So at the beginning, there's many of revelations that were coming down that invite to belief and reflection. Why? Because um, if you look at the top of that page, we're on 4.2 here. Basically, the um, what the author is telling us is that there's this change from the nomadic lifestyle over to the urbanization of Mecca. And this urbanization of Mecca was quietly changing everything into a materialistic mindset. Uh, there was exploitation, there was social injustice. And so in order for, um, you know, to really like shake, you know, the people out of, of this, um, you know, days that they were in with materialism and affluence, there are these uh, surahs revealed that said, you know, did you think that we created you just for fun and that you would not be returned to us? That's in Surah Mu'minun, verse 115. Another one, Dukhan, Allah says, we did not create the heavens and the earth and all between them merely for fun. We did not create them except for a truthful purpose, but most of them do not know that. The other one, An'am, uh, verse 29, then they say there's nothing beyond our lives on this earth, nor will we ever be raised to life again. So here, this is what some of the um, people who want to ignore the warnings uh you know, felt, they felt like this is the only life, but that's, you know, that, that is what is being corrected, right? If we look on page 111, um, it goes beyond just reflection and belief. Now it's inviting to patience. So if you look at the verses here, Surah Yunus, Surah Vashia, uh, the first passage is from Surah Fusilat, right? Uh, so, uh, you know, these are promises of patience. It says, on the contrary, those who said our Lord is God and then stood firm will have angels descending upon them, strengthening their hearts and have no fear, have no sorrow, except the good news of the garden that you have been promised. We're your protectors in this life as well in the next life, or we are your protectors in this life as well as the next life within which you will receive everything your souls ever desired and everything you ever asked for. And that's a welcome gift from the one who forgives and shows mercy. So what is that verse about? or that couple of verses, it's about a promise of a reward, right? So it's a promise of a reward uh, for the patience that they're having. And uh, similarly, you know, um, Surah Furqan, uh, another revelation that came, is that fate better or the eternal garden that has been promised to the mindful, right? And it goes on, so on and so forth. There's more, Surah Yunus and Surah Gashia. So these are the passages on page 
110 and 111, if you look at page 112, um, another passage from Surah Furqan, right? And um, basically all of these passages are Makkan surahs and they are usually short harmonious surahs that have rhythmic verses. They stress sincerity and inspire self-reflection. So the Makkan surahs have that similarity, right? They are all kind of these short, um, nice uh, revelations and they're all about the same themes. In fact, if you look at the bottom of page 112, this is a pretty important little chart. Those of you that have the book, on page 112 at the very bottom, there's this nice chart that I um, would you know, urge you to look at. It says, what was the earliest message of the Quran summarized? Well, the first point, God's goodness and power, and you have several surahs and verses here that are quoted, like 87, 1 to 3, surah 80, 25 to 31, surah 93, verse 3 to 8, surah 55, verse 26. So those are about God's goodness and power. The, uh, the next out of five is the return to God for judgment. This is another theme of the surahs that were revealed, the return to God for judgment, right? So accountability. The third one, man's response of gratitude and worship. That is the third one. Number four, man's response to God of generosity. So there's many verses that were revealed, such as surah 93, verse 9 to 11, surah 104, verse 1 to 3, and also Muhammad's own vocation. So his... Uh, actual being a messenger. We have Surah 74, verse 2, Surah 87, verse 9. So these were the earliest revelations, and I'm going to add all of these to that document that we have going, um, inshallah, and these are the summarized messages of those, okay? And another Kahoot question is that the early Meccan Surahs addressed what issues? Wealth and arrogance. Wealth and arrogance. So they did address belief, reflection, wealth and arrogance. These were, um, the wealth and the arrogance were seen to be some of the uh, causes for the, you know, for the problems of that time. If we look at section 4.3 on page 113, there's a passage from Surah Al-Furqan again. So, um, you know, it says, those who think they're never going to meet us say, why aren't their angels being sent down to us? Why aren't we seeing the Lord face to face? They think so highly of themselves and their audacity is enormous. When the day comes that they fully do see the angels, the sinners won't have any good news that day at all, okay? And then it goes on, and there's a little um, excerpt from Karen Armstrong's book about kafir, okay? And so it's interesting because what she says is, and, and this comes up again later in this section, that believe it or not, uh, a little background info that the, the people, the Quraysh and the disbelievers, did not necessarily deny Allah himself or deny the belief, but here, what Karen Armstrong says is the problem with the kafir is their arrogance. That is what she is saying. She is not a religious authority, but she is somebody who has written about, um, you know, about Islam and Muslims. And she is saying that uh, the kafirun are, uh, are really addressed for their arrogance more than anything else. Okay. If we look down, there's another passage from Surah Al-Isra, verse 95 to 96, where, um, you know, Allah says, say to them, if the earth were populated by angels going about their business quietly, then we would have certainly sent an angel from the sky to be a messenger for them. Then say, God is enough of a witness between you and me, for he is well informed and watchful of his servants. So what's happening is things are transpiring and, um, you know, revelations are coming in at the appropriate times, right? So let's say if they are saying, if, if the Kafirun are saying, well, why didn't God send an angel? Well, then at that time, Allah is sending a revelation saying, well, if we did send an angel, then so and so, you know, so it's kind of like coming at the appropriate times. One of the questions on the Kahoot is here. It says, istighna, istighna. It says, from the beginning, the Quran cautioned the Quraysh against their istighna. What is the meaning of that? It means haughty self reliance. Haughty self reliance. It's the opposite of tawheed, right? It's the opposite of humbleness. So when I ask you, I'm going to be asking you on the Kahoot, what is istighna? And you're going to know that that part of the right answer is haughty self-reliance, okay? And then we have surahs that are revealed, such as Al-Qari'ah. So we know the surah Al-Qari'ah is all about the Day of Judgment. It says, it's a day when people will seem like moths fluttering about when the mountains will be like tangled tufts of wood. Also, Surah Muzammil continues on Ayah 17. How then shall you shield yourself if disbelief in that day when, uh, when uh, which shall turn children gray? So let's move on to page 114. More passages from Surah Al-Isra, 
Okay, and then we go on to the story of Nuh, which is revealed in Surah Nuh as well. So um, here, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is giving them the story of Nuh. We go on to an important part on, on uh, section 4.4, which is the middle of page 114, called the smear campaign. And so, um, what's happening is that Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu influence is growing. The Quraysh don't like that, especially those who have the leadership and the wealth in Mecca. Okay, and um, so they start something called the smear campaign. And the leader of that smear campaign is Walid ibn Mughira, okay? Walid ibn al-Mughira, and he is a powerful leader right now. And he is, um, he is the leader who tries to, you know, spread lies and scandal about the Prophet in order to decrease his growing influence. And we go on to the second half of page 115, and there's uh, some more revelations that came in, Surah Al-Muddathir, verses 18 to 25. Surah Al-Hijr, uh, verse 6 to 7. So that one, for example, it says, um, the Meccans say, hey, you, the one who's getting this revealed message, we think you're crazy, so why aren't you bringing angels down to show us if you're really so honest? Okay, another surah that came down, Surah Sa'ad, at this time, it says, so are they surprised that a warner should come to them from their own people, yet the faithless only say, just a lying wizard, he, uh, has he lumped all the gods together to just one god? That is a strange thing indeed. We also have a passage from Surah Al-Qalam. Let's move um, along because of the time. The next uh, page has some more revelations that came down, Surah Tatfif, which is also the uh, short change, the Surah of short change. We also have Surah Al-Furqan and uh, Surah Nahal. So here we have several surahs that are mentioned. Section 4.5 is about the revelation of Surah Al-Abasa. And so the Prophet actually approaches Walid ibn al-Mughira. This is the most influential man in Mecca. And what happened is um, when he went to approach this influential man, there was a, bl a blind man that came in the midst of their conversation named Abdullah ibn Umm Makhtoum. Abdullah ibn uh, Umm Makhtoum. And he interrupts the Prophet by asking to hear a few verses of the revelation. And what did the Prophet do? He brushes him up. He kind of ignores him or he turns to the side. And that's when Surah Al-Abasa was revealed, okay? Surah Al-Abasa says, uh, Allah SWT says, Muhammad frowned and turned away when the blind man came. And it, he could have, it says, for all, uh, for all you knew, he could have grown in purity or received a useful reminder. The one who thought he needed nothing was the one to whom you gave your full attention, though he was not your responsibility. So the one who came to you eagerly in search of knowledge and who feared God, you neglected. So here, it almost reminds me of uh, like when a parent is telling a child, you know, you did something that was not right. And here Allah SWT is telling the Prophet that now whenever in life you come across uh, somebody telling you that the Quran was written by Muhammad, you can give them this example and say if it was written by Muhammad, why would he be saying something that he did wrong and making it public like that? This is obviously not written by Muhammad because it's, it's correcting the Prophet Muhammad. And so here... Um, this is one of the um, uh, this is one of uh, the notable things that was revealed during this time. If we turn to page 118, uh, we are now in year number five. Year number five. So if you want to be noting anything down on your circles, so we we did year number four. Now we're on year number five. On five, you can call that Abyssinia. On four, you can call that public call. You can call that the public call or the public invitation because that's when the public invitation started on year number five, you can call that uh, Abyssinia. So this is what happened here. Um, if we look on page 118, there's more passages, Surah An-Najm, okay, Surah Fusilat. And so here, um, uh, there's several, uh, you know, uh, there's stories of Surah An-Najm right here. So I can, I can share that with you. It says, this man, so despite their mockery, the mockery of the people, the Prophet continues to recite the remainder of the surah. It says, this man, Muhammad, is a warner, just like the warners of old. The day of judgment is getting closer and closer, and no one can move it forward, save God. So you are amazed. So are you amazed at this narrative? Will you laugh and not cry, wasting all your time in this useless distraction? Then know, uh, then know that you should bow down and prostrate before God and serve him. So this is, uh, this is something that came down to uh, the prophet and 
some of the, so what happened is some people who actually were mocking the prophet heard this and they immediately fell in prostration alongside of him. Okay. And so this, um, you know, this is an incident that happened. Some people came to mock the prophet and then these verses came down and they immediately went down in prostration. And because of that, they also got in trouble for believing in the prophet. And um, another, another issue that Surah Najm talks about is the idols named Lat and Uzza, okay? And so there, is, uh, there are some idols named Lat and Uzza that they used to worship. And it says here in verse 19 to 23, have you seen the idols named Al-Lat and Al-Uzza and the third one named Manat? What for you prefer males as sons, but then you assign God females for children that's hardly a fair deal. In fact, they're nothing more than names you've made up, you and your ancestors. God sends down no permission for you to do that. They're only following their own opinions and what they themselves foolishly desire. And so it is that guidance, and so it is that guidance has now come down from their Lord. So see if they will obey God now as they always claim that they would do. So this is just um, talking directly against these idols that people worship. If we look at the next page, 119, we are now on 5.2, that's uh, talking about um, Abyssinia. And so over the past four years, we know that the Prophet ﷺ was having a hard time. He was struggling, right? In the fifth year, uh, Surah Az-Zumar hints at the possibility of emigrating to Abyssinia to receive religious asylum. So if we look at the top of page 119, we have a passage from Surah Az-Zumar, which says, Muhammad, tell them that I have said, my believing servants, be mindful of your Lord. Good is for those who do good in this world. God's earth is wide, so you always have somewhere to go to escape evil. Those who patiently persevere will certainly be given reward without limit. Okay, and so um, there is a King Negus Ashama who uh, agreed to protect the Muslims. And if you look at this map at the bottom of the page, the green area, you can see where Abyssinia is in relation to where they were. Okay, and there is a man named Jafar ibn Abi Talib, and he was a companion, and this is a Kahoot question. He led 80 immigrants of the believers to Abyssinia, and they left in the fifth year of prophethood, okay? And they returned a few years later after the ban of Hashem was lifted. Jafar was one of the last to return 13 years later. So some of them returned five years later, some of them returned 15 years later, um, or, I'm sorry, 13 years later, and this is the man, Jafar ibn Abi Talib, who took 80 immigrants with him, turned the page, and they safely, so these 80 immigrants safely arrived in Abyssinia, and this included companions such as Uthman and Ruqayya, Jafar ibn Abi Talib, and his wife Asma, and Mus'ab ibn Umair, okay? Now, what happened is the Meccans heard about this, so they sent a mercenary named Amr ibn al-As to bring them back. So this man went and tried to bribe the Negus generals um, and tried to convince them to not protect and not accept the Muslims, but to send them back. And the interesting thing though, is that this same man um, later, 15 years later, will actually uh, embrace Islam. But at this moment, he's one of the mercenaries from the Prophet, uh, fr from the Makkans, I'm sorry. And so if we go to the next page, 121, we're on uh, section 5.3, Jafar, Amr, and Negus. This is the conversation on page 121 between Jafar, uh, what he says on front of the king, and uh, this is the uh, reply of the king. So upon his arrival, Jafar pleads the immigrant's case before the Negus. Negus just means king. He says, O king, we were an ignorant people. We worshiped idols and ate meat of dead carcasses. We were accustomed to lewd behavior, to the severing of ties of kinship, neglecting our neighbors, and the strongest among us consumed the weak. This is how we were, but then Allah sent a messenger to us. We were aware of his lineage, his truthfulness, and he was trustworthy and chaste. He began inviting us to Allah, that we single him out and that we worship him. So we left the religion of our forefathers that we had been previously following. We left the worship of stone idols of all others besides Allah. He also commanded us to be truthful in our speech, fulfill our trust, nurture the ties of kinship, and to be kind to our neighbor, and to refrain from spilling blood unlawfully. He forbade us from lewd behavior, from the bad speech, from consuming the orphan's wealth, and from slandering chaste women. 
He commanded that we worship Allah alone without associating anything with him. He commanded us to perform the prayer and give charity and fast. Okay, and then uh, Jafar continues when he describes Islamic injunctions. He said, so we entrusted him and believed in him and followed the religion of Allah that he delivered. We began to worship Allah alone. We would not associate anything with him and we began prohibiting what he made unlawful for us as well as allowing what he had made lawful for us. For this, our people rose as enemies against us, punishing us, torturing us to get us to leave our religion and to return to worshiping idols instead of worshiping Allah. And they expected us to consider all of the filthy things lawful that we previously did. So when they overpowered us, oppressed us, and restricted us, when they, be, when they came between us and our religion, then we came to your land. We chose you over the others beside you, desiring to be your neighbor and hoping that you, king, would not wrong us. Okay, so this is what Jafar said on front of the king. And then when uh, the king asked to hear a portion of the Quran, Jafar recited Surah Maryam, telling the story of Isa. And so there's a passage here that I'm not going to uh, spend, the time, uh, spend the time telling you, but it's an entire passage of Surah Maryam that he describes Isa. If you look on the next page, this made the Negus uh, come to tears. He was so moved. And he uh, definitely uh, chose to protect them. And he said that, and, and Jafar said, we speak about Jesus as we have been taught by our prophet, that he is a true servant of Allah, his messenger, his spirit, and his word breathed into Virgin Mary. And so, and then he continues to, to say more from Surat al Maryam. And so here, uh, moved by Jafar's eloquence, the Negus quickly dismisses Amr and returns his gifts. He didn't even take the gifts of Amr, okay? And so, um, but the Negus' actions trouble his advisors and he asked him why he believes in Jafar's testimony. He vaguely responded to appease them, but in his heart, he testifies to the prophet's message. So the Negus was a very good man. He protected the Muslims. If you look on this huge chart here on page 123, this is a list of all of the um, companions that, that went and stayed in Abyssinia. Many of them returned 13 years later and many of them returned after uh, the ban is lifted about five years later. And I would say a lot of these names, you know, we've already gone over um, the other time, so I'm not going to focus too much on this list, but you can, uh, you're welcome to study it if you would like to. And let's go to the next page. So uh, the next page is actually on 5.4. There are 14 clans of Quraysh. There are 14 clans of Quraysh, and that's what this entire section focuses on, uh, describing those clans. There is a nice little um, figure on page 125. And even though I'm going to just uh, say the names to you, we're not going to go into too much depth with it right now. We may go back and just learn a little bit more about it. But today, I do want to get to the end of, of, uh, of that section. So some of the names, we have the clan of Hashem here. We have uh, the clan of Muthalib, the clan of Asad, Zuhra, Thayim, okay, uh, Mahzum, Saham, Amir, Abu Shams, clan of Adi, clan of Juma. Clans of Hadith, Abu Dar, and Naufal. Okay, and so those are the names that are mentioned, and uh, we are going to actually go on to year six, which is the year that Hamza and Omar convert. So now we are on page 134. We still have 10 more pages to cover. And so this is about the conversion of Hamza and Omar. And uh, one of the things that I'm going to ask you about, Mustahziyin. Who were the Mustahziyin? If you look at that top 10, uh, box on page 134. The Mustahzi'in are people who used to make fun of the prophet. These are people who um, mocked him, gave him a hard time. Their title or their name is Mustahzi'in. And also the prophet um, at that time would perform tawaf. With, tawaf means circumambulating the Kaaba, right? We all know what tawaf is. And so uh, when he would do that, many of the Makkah leaders would uh, slander him, give him a hard time, and some of those included Abu Jahal, Abu Lahab, and Walid, uh, Walid ibn al mughira okay? So the Mustahziyin particularly were Abu Jahal, Abu Lahab, and Walid ibn al mughira If you look a little bit further towards the bottom of the page, there's an incident where um, Abu Jahal confronts the Prophet at the Kaaba and taunts him mercilessly. And the Prophet actually didn't complain. He returned to his house quietly. He didn't even say a word. 
And then what happened is his uncle Hamza was returning from a, a hunting expedition. And when he enters the holy precinct, there was a former servant of somebody, a former servant of the late Abdullah ibn Jud'an, and he pulls him to the side and describes what happened. So what does Hamza do? He goes straight over to Abu Jahl and strikes him with his bow and exclaims, you have been abusing Muhammad. I too follow his religion and profess what he preaches. So here, um, you know, uh, Hamza proclaims his uh, acceptance of Islam here, okay? And if we look at the next page, it's just another nice little chart that we're probably gonna look at more tomorrow in detail, but there's some really nice figures and illustrations about lineage and how people relate with each other. If we look on the next page, 136, we look at the conversion of Omar. And so Abu Jahl's 26-year-old nephew, Omar ibn al-Khattab, was a very outspoken critic of the Prophet Muhammad. He had heard uh, Surat al-Haqqa before, and he was convinced that the Prophet was a poet. In fact, uh, the surah says, so uh, this is Surah Haqqa, it says, so now I call to witness what you can see and also what you cannot see to demonstrate that this is truly the word of an honored messenger. These aren't the words of a mere poet. Oh, how little you believe. Neither are these the words of a fortune teller. Oh, how few reminders you take. And so although the Quran is beginning to speak to Omar, his attachment to the tradition of his forefathers prevents him from opening his heart to the Prophet's recitation, okay? And after the Quraysh's humiliating failure in Abyssinia, Omar realizes that the only way to wipe out the Prophet's movement is to get rid of the leader himself, which is the Prophet. So he actually gets ready to go and eliminate the Prophet Muhammad himself. And um, on his way, he's stopped by Nu'aim ibn Abdullah, who convinces Omar to first go to his sister's house because his sister's family had secretly joined Islam. So when Omar approaches Fatima's house, his daughter's name is, uh, um, his sister's name is Fatima, he approaches her house and he overhears Surah Taha in a very beautiful uh, you know, recitation. He's infuriated and feels betrayed. So he first attacks his brother-in-law physically, Saad ibn Zaid, and in the heart of the moment also strikes Fatima him, herself. Omar's rage quickly returns to remorse. So he quickly regrets it when he hears the surah. Okay, so here's Surah Taha, verse 14. Uh, we're here on the middle of the page. It says, I am God. There is no other God than I. So serve me alone and establish prayer so you can remember me. After Omar heard these verses, his heart just changed and he was just fully convinced to accept Islam. Okay, and so then we go to page 137. Then Omar heads to the prophet's house and Hamza had just converted three days earlier. We're in the sixth year of prophethood. Hamza had just converted. He was actually protecting his nephew. And then Omar actually just walks right past Hamza and he declares his wholehearted conversion to the prophet. And then he goes to the house of the prophet's enemy, uh, fiercest enemy, Abu Jahl. When the Makhzumi answers the knock at the door, Omar defiantly proclaims his new affiliation with the Prophet, and as expected, his uncle curses his young clansman and slams the door in his face. So this is what Omar says. We're on page 137 in the middle. Omar's defiant attitude immediately strengthens the Prophet's cause. Several years later, he reminisced. So this is Omar saying this several years later. He says, after I embraced Islam, I asked the Prophet, aren't we on the right path here and the hereafter? Why then do we have to conduct secret activities? I swear by Allah who has sent you with the truth that we will leave our concealment and proclaim our noble cause publicly. We then went out in two groups, Hamza leading one and I the other. We headed for the mosque in broad daylight when the polytheists of Quraysh saw us, their faces were pale and got incredibly depressed and resentful. On that very occasion, the prophet attached to me the epithet of Al-Faruq or the one who can tell right from wrong. So this is just a passage of the, um, you know, the reflection of Omar. If you look at the next page, we are now on 6.3, okay? Um, so here, 6.3 at the top, uh, we're on uh, page 138. The leaders of the Quraysh grow increasingly frustrated and they're unable to stop the Prophet's movement. So here now, the conversion of Hamza and Omar, it was kind of like a significant thing and it just adds to their desperation. So Utha ibn Rabia is a leading man of, of, uh, uh, of the Shams, tries to explain to the Prophet that the revelations are not only dividing the community, but dishonoring their forefathers. They're trying to have different appeals to the Prophet. So now 
they're saying you're dishonoring our forefathers. And what he says to the prophet is, oh nephew, if you're doing this with a view to get wealth, we will join together to give you great riches, greater riches than any Quraysh has possessed. If ambition moves you, we will make you our chief. If you desire kingship, we will readily offer you that. If you are under the power of an evil spirit, which seems to haunt and dominate so that you cannot shake it off, then we'll, we shall certainly call skillful physicians to treat you. So they're trying to appeal to him in so many different ways. They're saying, dear prophet, what do you want? We will give you whatever you want. So one thing to um, make note of is that, you know, even though it looks like the prophet was struggling, he was offered everything in the dunya. He was offered, I mean, even Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself offered him so many different things. And as you can see, the powerful uh, chiefs of Quraysh and the Makkans offered him a lot of things. And he could have had those things if he wanted to. He didn't want those things. He was much more noble than that. So he chose what he did. And then um, the prophet responds with a big passage from Surah Fussilat, which is here. Okay. And then it goes on on page 139 with more passages from Surah Fussilat. You know, we're looking at verses 1 to 6, and then 26, and then 37 to 38. And then, um, and then Utbah responds this way. He returns to the Quraysh, and this is Utbah's response. He says, I have never heard words similar to these recited. They definitely relate neither to poetry nor to witchcraft, nor do they derive from soothsaying. O people of Quraysh, I request you to take note of my advice and grant the man full freedom to pursue his goals. Okay, we're almost out of time. Um, we uh, go on to page 140. So here, uh, you know, just some more passages from, um, from the Quran. Surah Al-Qafirun also comes down in uh, 6.4. So uh, Walid ibn Mughira proposes a compromise, and that's when the Prophet responds to Surah Kafirun. That's on page 141. We also see uh, Surah Al-Kahf. So here, the Jewish, so here's what happened. The Quraysh decide to consult, we're on 6.5 now, page 142. The Quraysh decide to consult the Jewish rabbis of Yathrib, and the Jewish rabbis say that there's these three questions. If the Prophet can answer them correctly, then he is a messenger. And so clearly, you know, the prophet's going to know the answers to this. But what happened is the prophet actually says he's going to answer them the next day. He forgot to say the word inshallah. This is on page 142, uh, second, third paragraph at the top. He forgets to say inshallah. So because he forgot to say inshallah, the answers were delayed by 15 days. And it was kind of like this awkward silence. But we know from Surah Al-Kahf that, you know, we are commanded as Muslims that whenever we say we're going to do something, we have to say inshallah. Okay. And then, um, you know, some more passages from Surah Al-Kahf are shared on page 143. On 144, which is the last page, this is the um, Prophet's age is 46 here. It's after Omar's conversion. We have a chart of what the Prophet's household looked like at the end of early Mecca. So we're going to go into more detail about that, inshallah, over uh, the next class or so. But we did at least want to cover those here. I do have a short Kahoot game as well, and I want to um, show you one tiny other thing if I can. So I'm going to share my screen. So one tiny thing I wanted to show you is yesterday we did this um, we did this flashcard thing, but one way you can do it, you can flip it the other way. If you can see my screen, you can actually put the definition instead and just have a bunch of names as the answers and then you can just pick a name so i just want to point that out because as you're studying this information there's different ways to do it you don't have to do it only the way that we did it yesterday okay and then let's pop over to a quick kahoot as well so um if you cannot see my screen let me know i'm gonna turn this kahoot on this go okay are we ready eight two zero zero six eight two Okay, Bismillah, we're gonna start. Number one, the first public encounter was some Muslims got harassed for worship. Who wounds the instigator? This is the very first thing we talk about. Saad ibn Abi Waqas, Omar, Hamza, or none of these. Who is the person that wounds the instigator? Yes, the answer is Saad ibn Abi Waqas. So in the very first public encounter, when some Muslims got harassed, uh, the person who stood up for them, the companion that, that kind of protected them and stood up for them, his name was Saad ibn Abi Waqas. Let's go to the next question. Good job, girls and boys. Number two, what is Hilm? 
What is Helm? We talked in the beginning about a word named Helm. Fortune telling, forbearance, idol worship, or all of these? What is Helm? We talked about Helmy the hippo and the quality that the early predecessors had to have. The answer is forbearance, exactly. Very good. That's a hard word. You guys did great, mashallah. Number three, true or false? The Prophet Muhammad tells Abu Talib, if they put the sun in my right hand and the moon in my left, I shall not abandon my religion. Is that true or false? Did he say that to his uncle? Yep, all of you got the right answer, it looks like. Yes, mashallah, that is true. That is absolutely true. That's a memorable um, quote. Number four, true or false? The early surahs tell about belief and reflection. Is that true or false? The early surahs tell about belief and reflection. Yes, that is absolutely true. Good job, very, very good. Number five, early Makkan surahs address what? Wealth, arrogance, belief, or all of these? What do the early Makkan surahs address? Wealth, arrogance, belief, or all of these? The correct answer is all of these, exactly. Very, very good. We went over a lot of surah names today. Number six, which of these words means haughty self-reliance? Haughty self-reliance, istisqa, istikhara, tawheed, or istighna? Is it istisqa, istikhara, tawheed, or istighna? Exactly, it's istighna, which is the opposite of tawheed, right? Haughty self-reliance. Good job, Maryam, Maliha, Doc, Hania, Navid. Excellent. Number seven, which Makkan leader started the smear campaign? Walid ibn al mughira Omar, Hamza, or Abu Talib? Which Makkan leader started the smear campaign against the Prophet? Correct. The answer is Walid ibn al mughira I'm so proud of y'all. There are so many names to remember today. Jimmy, Manha, very, very good. Number eight, Surah Abasa is about when the Prophet did what? Got sick and could not pray. Place the black stone, frowned and turned away from a man, or none of these. Surah Abasa is about when the Prophet did what? Exactly, he frowned and turned away from a man. Good job, good job, good job. Number nine, Jafar ibn Abi Talib did what? Fled with war booty from Uhud, led a group to Abyssinia, yelled out in opposition to Prophet Muhammad, or none of these. What did Jafar ibn Abi Talib do? He led a group to Abyssinia, perfectly correct. Good job, mashallah. I think we're on the very last question, number 10. What year did Hamza and Omar accept Islam? Was it four, six, 10, or 20? What year did Hamza and Omar accept Islam? I know you guys are gonna get this right. We just talked about it. Mashallah, the sixth year, and that was a pretty significant year in our history. You guys did amazing, mashallah. Thank you so much for listening. Number, so Asma got third place, nine out of 10. Doc got nine out of 10. We also have Jimmy, mashallah. Mashallah, you guys did great. And we also have Mariam and Maliha who always do great, mashallah. And let's take a quick look and thank everybody here because y'all did great. That was a lot of names, a lot of information today. And everybody did great, including Jimmy, Doc, Asma, Mariam, Maliha, Manha, Shaila, Hania, Navid, Aisha, Sayed, Noor, Shanze, Arisa, Timmy, Sara, Saif, Lana, Sama, Kul Zainab, Aban, and Nazia, Hiba, and Aisha. Jazakallah khair, you guys are awesome. Inshallah, we're gonna go back into this information a little bit more tomorrow. So come right back, same time, same place. Subhanak Allahumma wa bihamdik. Ashadu an la ilaha illa ant astaghfiru wa tubu ilayhi wal asr. Inna al-insana lafi khusr. Illa al-ladina amanu wa amanu salihat. Wa tawasabu al-haqi wa tawasabu al-sabru. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.